gentlemen, uh, my name is Peter Hennessy. It's a great pleasure and honor to welcome you and welcome Douglas uh, Lord uh, Westman to talk to us this evening. Uh, I've known Douglas for a long time, so shortly after he seems to look after Ted Heath, he was looking after Ted Heath, he wrote a very good book. He's always, he's, he's always written a series of books, I like to think, with the life of us in mind, beginning with end of Promise, which I think really annoyed him quite a bit. But, uh, it was a fascinating account and remains a very vivid account of extraordinary years. Um, but Douglas is um, what one might call a practitioner, connoisseur, politician. He knows about previous generations. He's a dad hand of my company. And I've always loved talking to him since I was a young political journalist because he, he refracts unfolding events through the deep parts, which is exactly what I think he's going to do this evening. And you may think that those of us here from the House of Lords rather overdone it in terms of making it more interesting for them tonight than otherwise might be. Because we've got a great one listed constitutional crisis building up just down the other side. And John Reed, the ex Home Secretary, who I like very much, um, said to me, uh, we were all right until you came in in November. And it was not that shit. So apparently it's all my fault. So I'm proud of our great others of saying thank you so much for coming. You were very welcome. And what a subject. What a night. Well, thank you very much. Pleasure to come and, 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 and talk um, to an audience which seems to be largely composed of Peter's pupils. And, 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 uh, but, and, and I, I'm very grateful uh, to you for giving me this opportunity. As it actually happens, and I was going to touch on this, as it actually happens, uh, it's, a, it's a timely occasion because we are, uh, as, as I understand it, and I may exaggerate a little bit, we are entering into a substantial constitutional crisis as a result of the subject uh, which you've set for this uh, this evening, which is the House of Lords. Now you've asked me to reflect on it from a, a somewhat historical point of view, and I, I will do that in a minute. But I, I've just come from a meeting, just by the old staff time, um, packed meeting, such as only happens at, at moments of drama. Um, and uh, I will try to explain to you why, in his view, and in the view of most of those who spoke, uh, we are heading into a constitutional crisis, of which the press uh, so far uh, uh, understood nothing, uh, of which really, which really we've lurched into, as often happens in the real world, uh, without anybody actually wanting it. Um, but I will go back into, into, into history for, for, for a few moments. We are uh, celebrating, if that's the word, the um, conclusion of the 1911 Parliament Act uh, 100 years ago. Um, and since that act, which divided the nation in a way which um, it's hard actually to, to match, that combination of the House of Lords issue and the Ulster issue coming really at the same time, um, that, 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 um, convulsed the nation, or at least the politically conscious part of the nation, to the extent that, as we all know, the murder of the Archduke in June 1914 seemed to be of very little importance uh, for the future of our country. Um, but it turned out to be tragically different. But since then, the question of the future of the House of Lords has exercised just about every parliament, um, but not in a way which has produced anything. Um, not in a way which actually has resulted in any dramatic new legislation. Uh, there have been adaptations uh, to the 1911 Act. It, it's, it's changed. Life periods have been introduced. The, the delaying power, which used to be two years, is now been reduced to, to one year. But these are not fundamental. These are not extraordinary changes. They've occurred through the ordinary rubbing and shoving of uh, parliamentary <coughs> politics. And what we has happened though, during this time is that the, the position, uh, the attitude to the House of Lords of the main parties has dramatically changed. The, the Labour Party uh, went through a very substantial abolitionist phase. They, they believed, or the majority of them said that they believed, that there was no scope for the House of Lords uh, and, and, and that it should be abolished. I think Sir Stafford Cripps uh, was moving that in, in a Labour Party conference in the, in, the, in the 1930s. That was, as it were, the Labour orthodoxy. Uh, and the 
Tories were divided, uh, had been very much divided in 1911 between the ditches, the people who wanted to die uh, in the last ditch for every fragment of the House of Commons power, and, 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 the, and, the, and the rats, or as they preferred to call themselves, the hedges, who, who were prepared to compromise. Uh, and the, those who were prepared to compromise in those last final days of uh, the crisis in 1911 won, but by a narrow uh, majority, and, and so the Parliament Act uh, was passed by a majority, and I think 17, but people will correct me if I got figures wrong, but it squeaked through, leaving behind a good deal of, of, of bad blood. So the two parties to change, the Labour Party has changed from, a, from an abolitionist proposal to a proposal which I doesn't really quite know what it is, but, but it, is, um, uh, it, it, it is really indistinguishable uh, from the uh, proposition in the coalition agreement between the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats, uh, we, we, which is that the House of Lords should be reformed, uh, and there's a great sign of trumpets when that is announced, uh, <laughs> and, and, and it should be reformed, transformed onto a basis which has popular support, uh, and, and which is, uh, and then the actual phrasing differs slightly, uh, basically uh, it is, it's wholly or partly uh, on an elected basis. And you can fiddle about with those phrases a, a little bit. But we don't yet know what the government, what the Kurdish government will actually propose. It, it was supposed to be produced by the end of last year. We are still waiting for it. And we are told that it will be here this month, next month, who can tell? Uh, it's Nick Clegg's uh, white paper, uh, or green paper, I'm not quite sure which. Uh, and anyway, we, will, we are within an edge, within a, with an ace of, of, of seeing that. And then we will go into another phase, which I've lived through several already, of infinite reflection and discussion and cogitation, preceded by the Deputy Prime Minister Nick Clegg saying, don't think that this is just another talking shop, this time we're really going to do business. Well, we should see. We should see. I mean, lived through and the history book of the 20th century is full of these essays in reform, uh, all of which have sputtered out uh, after the time. Uh, but anyway, there has been, this is a general point I'm making, there's been some uh, coming together. No easy of words, no apology for what has been said in the past, uh, no apology for the Labour side for wanting to apologize for <coughs> the great world of no uh, apology for the Tories for having uh, attempted to die in the, in the last in the last stitch. So there's been no great uh, uh, confessions of fault or failure, uh, but there has nevertheless, as sometimes happened, been a coming together. So that it is possible, in theory, it is possible in theory to conceive of a solution of a, of a reform of the House of Lords, which uh, does actually command general support. It would have to be on this basis of whether the directly elected, the popular election, would be for all or part, and if part, in what proportion, of the uh, members of the House of Lords. Um, and, and that would be, of course, deeply and passionately uh, fought over. You can imagine, in theory still, in theory, you can imagine a solution hovering somewhere between 60 and 70 percent elected. I mean, if you split the difference between the speeches and the positions which people have actually taken up in, in public in the last uh, year or so, you'd arrive somewhere in the 60s or 70s. I'm a 50 percent man, I've voted that way uh, several times. I, I, I think there's no particular magic in it, but there's a certain crude logic in it. And, and, uh, uh, and so that's where I am. <coughs> the leader of my party is Tom Strathclyde, um, whose convictions in this matter are a little hard to probe, but he clearly is not naturally hugely enthusiastic, but he, he votes for uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the House of Lords and, and presumably in the, in the Cabinet, um, a, 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 a definitely a, an elected majority. Uh, and that is the position of the Prime Minister, which he, which he stated, and the position of the majority of the Conservative Party in the House of Commons. So uh, that's, that's <coughs> the scene is set in that kind of direction. Uh, but what has happened in the last few days, um, uh, 
may quite substantially uh, upset this equilibrium, or rather upset this gradual, slow, iceberg-like convergence of two parties which seem about to uh, crash, to set on a Titanic-type uh, uh, course for an iceberg. Um, uh, uh, also, just one could see on ways in which the crash would be avoided. Enter a completely new situation, a new factor, and this is the sort of muddle thing which happens in, 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 in party politics. Enter the, uh, uh, the uh, what's it called, Robin? The, the, the bill we're discussing at the moment. It's a, an electoral system of constituencies, so the voting system of constituencies. Precisely. And um, this bill has two parts. The first part provides for a referendum, a popular referendum, uh, in which everybody will vote uh, on, uh, on, February, uh, on uh, May the 5th, uh, as between the first pass the post system for electing the House of Commons and the alternative vote system for electing the House of Commons. And the uh, Liberal Democrats in the coalition are in favour, probably would be in favour, of a full PR system. AD is not a full PR system, but they, 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 they've agreed that the referendum should be on an AD versus first past the post choice. Uh, that is the first part of the bill now being, which is passed the House of Commons, uh, and which is now in the Lords. The second part, uh, the part uh, 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 in which the House of Lords, as we speak, is locked more or less deadly in combat, is concerning the uh, restructuring of constituencies. The reduction of the House of Commons from 650 to 600 members, quite a substantial uh, reduction, partly driven by the need to save money and partly driven by the thought that the politicians are not, not all that popular uh, at the moment, and the, the electorate on the whole would welcome if there were fewer of them. Um, and, and, that, and, that, and that is the second part of the bill. And this bill, as I say, is being debated as we speak. Uh, in, in, the, in the House of Commons, having already passed through the House of Commons. And the Labour Party, I'm sure without any encouragement from cross benches like Peter Hennessy um, or, 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 the, or, 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 or the or the or Robin Butler, um, have uh, uh, the, 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 the short, a small number to get this as accurate as I can. A small number, mostly of fairly recent arrivals in the House of Lords, arrivals from the House of Commons on the Labour side, have chosen this occasion to lodge what is, in my view, and I think right, the, the, the objective view, is a filibuster. That's to say, it speaks, they have spoken for night after night uh, on matters relevant and irrelevant uh, to the bill, to part two of the bill, uh, which is what we're discussing at the moment. And they have gone on and on. They have fallen in love uh, with the sound of their own voices, uh, which is a House of Commons maladie professionnelle, uh, <laughs> which, which we all, all, all encounter from time to time. And, and, uh, and they have gone on, hour after hour. And nothing, I promise you, is more dreary in the world of politics than listening to that kind of speech over and over and over again. And, and, and people go to sleep, they get to, they become indignant and then they become resigned really to this ludicrous uh, waste of time. Um, you see that the background is a, is, a, is a formidable political problem. This is so much of the argument to be now uh, 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 about the House of Commons has been about the relationship between the House of Commons, which everybody agrees is the major partner in legislation. It, it, it has the, the biggest say, and, and that's proved by the Britons of the Parliament Act, that if there is disagreement and the country <coughs> maintains its position after a period of a, a delay of one year, the House of Lords has to give way. And that reflects accurately the, the relative strength of the two houses as it has hitherto appeared. But here we have a bill which has passed the Congress which has passed, which has been approved by the main legislative body. And um, 
in such a case, um, if it were a Labour government which was proposing the bill, and the House of Lords uh, had sought to block it or filibuster it, there would be a substantial uproar because it would be said that the popular chamber uh, had done its work, had approved the bill, and sent it to the less popular chamber uh, who could revise and scrutinise. Of course, that is their job. Uh, but who certainly couldn't, at the end of the day, actually reject it, except by, by, by oh, after the, the, the debate by the Parliament Act uh, of, 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 of one day. So you've got a, 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 a topsy turvy situation. Uh, and uh, you've got a, now a conservative uh, coalition, led, a, a conservative, co a conservative led coalition, um, using some of the old rhetoric about how monstrous it is that an unelected house should uh, presume to interfere with the decisions of the elected House of Commons. Um, and on the Labour side, um, they, they have, as it were, unearthed um, ancient speeches which they never made, but other people did, about the importance of the House of Lords as a, as a, as a, as a, uh, a body which could not only scrutinise, but actually could amend uh, the, the, House of, the legislation passed by the House of Commons. Now, the procedure which normally resolves this, this is, this is not a, a new problem. Um, the clash of the two legislatures exists wherever there are two bodies. Um, and it's, it's used by some people as an argument for uni, the unicameralons and for not having a second chamber at all. But the, the device which the House of Lords through the years has actually found for resolving this problem is that you, the, is the usual channels. That there is a meeting held uh, between the leaders of, of, the, of the parties um, and they agree a timetable. And uh, they, 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 they mutter a good deal about the timetable. Um, they believe their own spokesman had to fought hard enough, etc. Uh, but they, they, at the end of the day, there is a date agreed uh, by which the House of Lords would have finished its, its work of scrutiny and examination. Now, that works fairly well alongside the basic principle. The House of Lords is, so, is self regulated that means that any member of the House of Lords, anyone, can get up and propose an amendment to government legislation and get a reply from a minister. They may not satisfy him or her, but he can then vote accordingly. But that is a principle, an underlying principle of the House of Lords, which is extraordinarily permissive. I think it's very unusual in the legislatures of the world for someone to have that absolute right regardless of how much support he or she has, to make an amendment to a government proposition and to have that amendment uh, discussed and, and dealt with. Um, but that is, um, uh, the, 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 so the issue at the moment, as we fight our way futile, hour by hour, through this uh, bill, through the provisions in the bill, which will also the uh, way in which boundaries are allocated by the Boundary Commission, uh, removed by imposing a, a statutory obligation to be mathematically fair, so that each constituency has roughly the same number of people, give or take 5%. Uh, um, and, and therefore, the Labour Party will no longer have, uh, as they've had ever since I've been around, a considerable advantage in uh, the next general election, as I say, it will require, uh, it would require, again, uh, fewer people to elect a Labour member of Parliament than it would in the Senate. This is quite a different issue from that of the electoral system. It is about the actual working at the moment of the existing first part of post system, modified at intervals by a boundary commission, which looks at population changes, looks at other factors, and revises the Boundaries, but does so, of course, as it were, posthumously after the event. Uh, so it, 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 the Boundary Commission has no way of saying uh, in, in the 2005 election the Conservatives should have won because they had more votes. If they did, because it, you, you, they can't adjust uh, uh, results uh, retrospectively. So that, that's, that's the issue. That's what we're arguing about. Right? But you see how it becomes not 
just an issue of party parties, though this does come into it, but a, a, an issue of constitutional principle. Um, there we go. Um, uh, concerning the actual uh, relative strengths of the two houses of parliament. And that will affect, undoubtedly affect, the proposals uh, which the uh, executive will come forward with for two weeks for the actual reform. The actual nature of the reform will be affected quite substantially, I believe, by the uh, outcome of the present commotion and conflict about uh, uh, the, the, the present. Uh, are we going to come on? It's the comments. Of the comments. But that's really uh, what I have to say, ladies and gentlemen. And I know, I know that I've woven the existing crisis into the uh, analysis of the past because I think it, it, is, it is going to have a, power, a powerful effect on, on what happens in the, in the next few weeks. And uh, uh, so I, I rest there and I'll be glad to give you any, any questions. Oh. Who'd like to start? Come on. Um, you haven't mentioned David Seale and talked about the backbenchers. Would it be true to say that the majority of the House would prefer to have an appointed system rather than um, some kind of election system? The majority of the House of Lords has, has uh, quite consistently supported an appointed system. And David Seale is supporting that, isn't it? Yes, David Seale has a bill, or had a bill, uh, which made certain changes. He would put the Appointments Commission, which is the body set up by Prime Minister Blair, to appoint to the House of Lords backbench, non-party uh, 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 members, and we have been on the Appointments Commission since it was formed. And, and, and we do that in small numbers e e e each year. Uh, we, we've just done another two, for example. Uh, that is less important than the power of the party leaders to, uh, it, to so there's a big gap between front benches and the rest of the house. Yes, that's right. So, so David Seale is, is, is against that. has become uh, less enthusiastic as the years have gone by by the idea of an elected house. And this proposal is his proposal, the Steel proposal, the Steel Bill, is an attempt to update, modernise the existing system. I think he would say probably that's pending uh, an overall reform. But he is one of the many people who doesn't think an overall reform. It's going, to, it's going to come very quickly and therefore wants to improve the, the present system. Thank you. He would dispose of the remaining hereditaries. And he would dispose of the remaining hereditaries by refusing to have by elections. I mean, one of the objectives no, of the uh, solution which uh, uh, Tony Blair and, uh, and, and, the, and the Tories worked out, and Robert Cramble uh, worked out uh, to settle uh, the immediate problem uh, four or five years ago was that. When a hereditary peer of whom the 92, the 92 dies, um, there is a by-election. Yes. And the uh, hereditary peers, uh, remaining surviving hereditary peers of his party, go into a huddle and choose someone to take his place so that the hereditary system is not going into peaceful liquidation by the processes of death. Um, the great Reaper is not left to do his work in a tidy way, uh, but the uh, actual by-elections, which is, I think, absurd. And still, anyway, we do away with these by-elections, which I think are still very similar. Yes. Um, um, Mr. Blair, um, I just wondered, you, you ended there in an interesting note saying, um, the crisis that's going on is going to greatly affect what Nick Clegg brings forward. You sort of stop there. How will it affect it, and why? I did what? I... So how will the current standoff affect what Nick Clegg brings forward, and, and, and why? So, I mean, I wasn't... Because I think it will affect in ways which I can't exactly predict, but I think it, it, it will have an effect on how people view what will be the Clegg proposals. Uh, how he strikes the balance, if he does strike the balance, uh, between uh, a, a wholly elected house and a, and a wholly appointed house. Uh, 
Now, his colleagues <coughs> are for election, and that indeed is the official policy of the Liberal Party. But uh, if the result of more and more people coming in from a process similar to, different no doubt in some ways, from the way the House of Commons is elected, and if they bring into the House of Lords uh, habits of filibuster, which are alien to the House of Lords and which are not part of the House of Lords tradition or rules, uh, then it will be less likely that the uh, House of Commons and the House of Lords will approve those particular proposals. So there will be, whatever claim proposes, the, the, the reaction to them by the body politic will, will be affected, I think, by what happens over this particular uh, bill, and this two miles over this particular bill. You haven't really said what it is you'd like to achieve. I mean, could you set out what do you think the reform should be and why? Okay. And why should the ordinary punter care about it? Is that my point? Should the ordinary punter and the city <laughs> care about it? Well, it, well uh, how would it improve the business of government? The, the, uh, the, the second question is, is, is more difficult to answer than the first. I, I, I'd be very clear, though, but I'm a 50 50 man, right? I don't agree uh, that uh, I, I think there's a strong case for having uh, a, a substantial minority at any rate of people who are appointed, not appointed by the Prime Minister, but appointed, say, by the Appointments Commission, by, um, a, a, a appointed by um, a, a, a respected body of, of, of outsiders. Chosen people, people who chosen for their distinction in, 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 in their profession, in the walk of life, like, like Peter Hennessy, like Robin Butler. Um, not, not, uh, and and uh, will not, therefore, go to be behave as if they were uh, besotted partisans of, of one party or another, uh, but, but are actually going to bring some kind of independent judgment to bear. It's one of the good things about the House of Lords is the, is the fact that you've got a minister introducing a bill. He, he, there's no body, no party which has a majority. So the minister is, often, is always looking for the votes. He hasn't got the votes in his pocket. Uh, he can't be sure that he's going to carry the clause. And this is quite unknown in the House of Commons, but it's absolutely common in the House of Lords. So the minister is always he's, he's looking around him, he's counting his friends, and they will vary as, the, as his speech continues. He'll lose some and gain some. Uh, and, and that is another fascinating process to watch. Uh, and and, and uh, therefore, uh, I think there's a strong case of having a substantial minority uh, which is appointed by this independent means. But I, I accept. Um, having listened to little speeches about this for so long, that, and, and we did on the Royal Commission, the Royal Commission, we did accept that there was a case for having a, 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 a minority or a majority during <coughs> a popular election. But we would add that there has to be a different system uh, from that of the House of Commons. A, a different term, a longer term for sitting in the House of Lords. Um, and, and, and in different ways, and the relationship between the um, numbers in the House of Lords and the numbers in the House of Commons, there should be a relationship, a, a correlation of some kind. But exactly how that's going to be worked out, I don't know. But there should be some, they should be different from the House of Commons, um, but, but, but there should be a, 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 a total clash uh, between, between the, the strength of the different parties. So that, that's the kind of thing I'm groping towards. I don't see your second question. I think it's just as I think on the AV referendum, it's going to be very difficult to stimulate enough public interest to, 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 to justify the referendum. Um, so I would agree with you that I think it's going to be very difficult on these these uh, House of Lords matters to stimulate enough uh, passionate interest. Um, I, I was on the way to the as I said, and we went around the country um, addressing other small audiences um, in, in, in August and Newcastle and whatever, uh, on, on our proposals for the House of Lords. And I, I was conscious that this was not going particularly well. Not because we projected it, but because they didn't find the subject particularly interesting. Now, there are always exceptions to that, and probably some of them in this, in this room. That, that was my impression. Do you think there should be a referendum on the on Lords Reform? Because it's a big change to the Constitution. 
if it's um, a substantial elected delegate. I mean, no, the I word is it's going to be 80% elected, 20% appointed. That's what we're going to get. You really think that's worth a referendum? I really think you know, that is the sort of thing we ought to be able to sort out for ourselves. Yes. We may not be able to, we may make a hash of it. Uh, and, and indeed, I think sometimes I think nothing will happen. But no, 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 no solution will find a majority support. But I really think we need to restrain the appetite for referendum or something. We don't have enough. May well, I suggest to invite your comments on uh, an answer to that last question about why the ordinary function of the yeah. speech should care about it? And the reason that I would suggest is that the government <coughs> have it too easy in the House of Commons. They dominate the Parliament and they can get anything they like through. The House of Lords, as you said, can make them think again, can make, at least make them pause. And uh, of course it's right that the elected House should have the final say. But it does seem to me that we ought to be able to enthuse the man in the street with the idea that uh, it's necessary that there be another body in Parliament that just can cause a bit of a pause. No, no, no I entirely agree with that. Uh, whether you find that um, uh, emotionally um, um, amazing, dramatic proposition, I don't know. I think it's common sense. And I think we're in a position where we can make that argument. And that is the argument. Uh, which we will, we, will, we, will, we will need to make in order to justify uh, public attention to this subject, but not, I think, to justify going so far as having a referendum on the detail. Okay. Right. Uh, Lord Hood, um, given the gap that you described that's opened up between the public electorate and, and the parliament, um, and drawing on your experience of foreign affairs and knowledge of other parliamentary systems around the world, do you think uh, it's still sustainable to argue, as Churchill did, that our uh, system is uh, worse in all the world, except for all the rest? Do you think there are models that we should be looking elsewhere for perhaps more radical ideas? I can't actually think at the moment of a, of a, of a, of a, of a model which I, I believe we, we would gain by copying. Um, when one looks at the, the systems in Europe or systems in the United States, let alone the systems in uh, Russia and China and so on, um, I think what we worked out with all its imperfections and all its question marks, um, which this argument, which this argument uh, has brought, is just one smallish part. Uh, I think I think it's a, as, as good as you get for the British people. Every, every country has its own history, its own battles in the past, its own reform bills or the equivalent, um, and, and, and we've had ours, and we've been shaped by them. Um, I'm writing a life at Israel at, at, at the moment, available in the outside, and all good to And believe me, he faced all this, and he might have dodged it. Um, but but um, we, we've had our experiences, and, and, and they've shaped our own, our own reactions. Uh, I think. Uh, I wouldn't go along with the great Duke of Wellington, who said that uh, not only was ours the best system in the world, but if he was asked for advice by any other country, he would have no hesitation in, in suggesting that they move to our system as soon as possible. I wouldn't go quite as far as that, because I think each, each country has its own, has its own formation, it's formed in a different way. Um, but I think that for, for what we have, we should help with it. Do you think there's a potential role in the appointment of the House of Lords in rebalancing a perceived problems with the electoral system? So in a way, joining the two issues to in effect appointing on the House of Lords the elected proportion of the House of Lords in a way of addressing uh, any imbalance caused by a first pass or even an A B system? Well, that's the, that's the sort of uh, amendment to the eventual bill which would be you know, eagerly, eagerly and, and genuinely worked upon. To what extent should the elected House of Lords, that party which is elected, reflect the votes previously cast in a general election, or your point, should counter, if need be, the, the, uh, any bias which has been introduced by the House of Lords system, which are really arguing either way. Um, and and there, will be that, there will be that argument. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I think I rest it there. 
that there is a case for a relationship between the House of Commons results and the, House, and the uh, membership of the House of Lords. There's a case of relation to two. Exactly in what way you do that, I think, it would matter for endless to them. That means you've looked at the composition of the Lords, those that are there because of blood, heredity, those that are there because of partisan politics, those that are there because of their professional background, but you've not mentioned the bishops, those that are there because of piety. Huh. <laughs> and they're really rather terrific, they look terrific, but also they say interesting things. I mean, I'm rather a fan of the bishops. I don't think you, 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 you object to them because they no, say... No, no, I don't object to them. I think they're really rather terrific. They are. Yeah, they're decorative. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, because they, they wear their clothes, by the way. And the form of prayers which we use in the, in the House of Lords is subtly different from the form of prayers in the House of Commons, and it might be superior. And, uh, the bishops are in charge of their operation. Uh, no, there, there are 16. Yes, there 26. Are 16. Sorry? 26. 26, no, 26, that's right. There are 26 uh, bishops, and they, and they rotate. Um, uh, they, 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 according to the C, you well, have, some are, it's more complicated than that, than I'm uh, getting into, into deep water. Some are ex officio. Three of them. Three of them. Yeah. Durham, uh, London, and Canterbury. And two, they, they, they do. And then uh, the others, seniority. And the others, uh, the others uh, become, uh, the others are rotate. They, they rotate according to the importance of their seats, and they vary a good deal. Some like the uh, um, uh, Richard Harris, the uh, late Bishop of Little Oxford, until recently, but he's, he's been made alive here, um, actually by Tony Blair, um, just uh, on his own merits as well, although he's no longer uh, an elected uh, no longer a, a bishop. I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, in favour of having that. Uh, they're not big enough, they're not numerous enough to impose anything. Sports. And I think they are, um, broadly speaking, a civilizing influence. But it's, but it's wrongly uh, sorted out. The, the reason I had I mean, 16 in my mind is because we thought uh, in, on the Wake of the Commission that 16 was the right number uh, of uh, Franklin Commissions, and that the remaining 10 should be divided uh, between different faiths. Um, there's a problem about that, uh, which is that different faiths. Um, are extraordinarily difficult to select. The Vatican, for example, doesn't want to have a seat, doesn't want the Cardinal to sit in the House of Lords, although the Catholic Church and the Church of Scotland in, in Scotland had a rather different view. It would be very hard to find the right Muslim because there is no structure in the, in the Muslim world corresponding to the, to the uh, Church of Rome or the Church of England. And, and similarly with, other, uh, with, 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 the, with the Chief Rabbi. Um, there, there is a problem because it, 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 with, with the Church with the, the of Scotland is a problem because the, the moderator of the Church of Scotland is only in, 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 in power for one year uh, and, and, and he moves on. And, and obviously, I don't think I would expect them to move in and out of the House of Lords in quite that case. Um, so, the, the, we looked at this in some detail and, and were, were baffled. So, we came to the conclusion that, that 26 is too many, that 16 is about right. And, and that you would have to have a, a, a detailed argument about how to divide the, the, the ten remaining. <coughs> um, do you feel that the removal of the law lords from the House of Lords has essentially had a detrimental or beneficial effect overall? Well, I think, uh, I, I don't think either really. I think we, 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 we've absorbed that change. Without any great difficulty, I don't know. Um, I, I, I really don't. I, I think the law always made a contribution. I, I think the, the house tended to fill when when we see that the law lord was speaking or about to, about to speak, and that's a reasonable test of influence. Um, but but the, the numbers were not great, and the quality was high. Uh, and and um, in, in a way, I think the whole business of the Supreme Court was was, was mishandled. Uh, uh, Prime Minister at uh, uh, that time thought that something was quite simple when in fact it proved to be rather uh, difficult in uh, abolishing the role of the Chancellor. Uh, but we, we've learned a little bit. We've absorbed, we've absorbed a lot. Yes. Um, it's something I'm not entirely certain of myself, but a few years back, um, I, remember, I think, uh, uh, 
law term that I was talking about, the, uh, one of the benefits of the laws is the ability to bring in um, expert people from outside into government. Yes. Okay, into, into government. Now, it seems to me that the, uh, the way that we're moving, if we do go to a fully elected House of, of Lords, um, it's going to be much more difficult for that to the point of impossible. Yes. Uh, to bring people in very quickly. Um, I'm sure that there's people in the audience who wouldn't approve, but you know, when you when Lord Mandelson came from Brussels and straight into the cabinet, um, there was ability there. There was, you know, you might not like him, you might not look whatever. There's ability coming in, high quality ability coming straight Yeah, absolutely. I entirely agree. And I think it's a very neat uh, uh, Peter Mandelson in the laws. Uh, so we have a problem in a flash. And Lord the Domus as well. Yes. You know, real people of, of, of ability. Do you, fear, do you fear that under the current proposal we may be about to lose, instead of gaining ability in government, actually lose it? No, I think, I think it would be a great pity if we did that. I think there must be scope, but not just for politicians. I think we, we benefit hugely from having uh, people who, 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 are, who are still acting and effective in, 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 in the head of different professions. And that's why the great arguments against having wholly elected, uh, because you would deprive yourself. But there are lots of people sitting on the, on the cross benches who wouldn't dream of running for election, not because they feel they're too grand, because they just feel they wouldn't get in. You know, they, they wouldn't, they're not fitted to the political life, they haven't chosen it, and they wouldn't fit it to it. So they, 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 they would simply disappear from the scene if you had a wholly elected um, I mean, Joe Coffin, who is my Labour counterpart on the, on the, um, on the Wake Commission, he made this point very quickly. If he, if he, he said, you know old blogs, and they remember for both means. Uh, old blogs is there because um, he's a decent fellow, and it was bad luck that he didn't get the European seat, and it was bad luck that uh, um, he, he failed to get the last comment. But he's been a good Labour chap all these years, and then Ralph his wife has faded away. And uh, so, you know, he should have a go. And that sort of person um, would be the person who would be chosen by the Labour Party to represent them in the House of Lords. And this was a Labour member of Parliament speaking. Um, and I know you would find uh, parallel examples of, 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 of typical Tories who get in on the same sort of process. What is your view, Lord Mayor, on payment for members of the House of Lords? Um, there is a difficulty, as we've seen with Lord Taylor, for people who give public service and don't get a, a reward that um, makes it possible for them to do their jobs in the way that was expected. No, it, is, it is a real, a real, a real problem, this. So I think, um, well, I won't go to, uh, I, I think tears for Lord Taylor would be, would be misplaced. <laughs> um, because uh, there's a nature of this attacks. Uh, but, but it is a problem. Are we to be paid, uh, or, or are we to be to have quite a generous system of expenses that which you have to account for? Um, and we have a, a, a system of expenses which has been improved, but it's not it's, it's not noble, it's not magnificent. Um, but on the whole, it's thought by the class that be by the cabinet um, that um, that it would be acceptable to the public. But I think the moment we said um, and in addition. Well, the place of that, uh, there's going to be a, a substantial salary uh, uh, for, for, for peers. Um, you, the, the, the fact will be in the fire. It will be a big round. But do you not therefore limit <coughs> people who would be eligible um, because they wouldn't be able to afford the awards who could be um, elected? Wouldn't that lead to a, a difference between the appointed members who perhaps might be distinguished and have pension? And those who are to be elected will This is one of the problems which will have to be tackled. <coughs> uh, it is a, the case, if you've made the case, for having a uh, payment for elected members, but could you justify having payment for elected members and not for appointed members? I mean, the moment you create that distinction, you're, 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 it's quite a can of worms. It would have all kinds of consequences. Right. Um, Lord, Lord, do you expect the current controversy to lead to um, any curtailment or change the procedures of the House of Lords? Do you think that will come about through the self-regulation of the Lords? 
Well, you're racing in very intelligent ahead, and how the nuclear was avoiding what would be the outcome. But obviously, there will be uh, quite strong pressure uh, from the government uh, to introduce some kind of restrictions, um, some kind of timetable, such as is, of course, the practice of the House of Commons, uh, some kind of timetable for for bills. Now, no decision has been taken on that, and it will be there are plenty of people, including my own party, who are strongly against it, as I've just been hearing. Um, but it is an option, and it's an option which will prove more attractive to the government as the weeks pass and the bill slips further and further out of control. But, so, I think. So, so, the can I just have one more go? Yes, I'm sorry. I think on the. Um, Interesting to say that the sort of people who might be put up by the parties for election are people who've been in the House of Commons, the good old soldiers and so on, distinguished. And people who are appointed it would probably continue to be people like Peter and me. Now, actually, the sort of people you describe who put up for election is very much the people who are there now. So do you think we might go through all this process and produce a house that looks almost indistinguishable from the House of Commons? Very possible. Very, very, very possible. Um, I, I just think that if the, the, the more you have um, elected, popularly elected members, the, the greater the danger that you are simply producing a, a replica of, of the House of Commons. With all the, 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 the force that it has, it has the advantage that it's elected. And there is something called the tyranny of the elected person. Once you've been elected to, to something, you, you feel you're somebody, you know, it's, it's better than being a professor, you know. Um, <laughs> but it, but it's, 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 uh, it, there is a, a feeling when you get elected to something uh, that, that, that this is something rather special. Um, and, and that would spread. Uh, and, and that's quite obvious in the, in the, in the way that the, these uh, Labour members of Parliament are behaving, which you could have an equally uh, problem on the, on the Tory side. So I don't think it's a, a, a party matter, but I do think it's perfectly possible. The outcome, after not too much of an argument, might be really relevant <laughs> uh, to what we have now. Mm. I think you, you had a, yes. I did. I had a question which picks up slightly from something you said earlier and was reflected a little in the question over there. It's a question about the term length. You said you were thinking possibly of <coughs> an extended period for the Lords. And I just rather wondered whether or not that would lead to problems of cohabitation that we see on the other side of the channel from time to time. And will that be a strength in the future or a hindrance? Well, you, you, I, you could have two, two parties that you know, have different parties holding the balance in different yeah, yeah, two yeah, centers. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, well, you, you could, you could, could result. And, and then, then, there's a whole range of possibilities, isn't there? Mm -hmm. once, you, once you go down that road. Uh, and and, and I, think, I think you could. You, you, could, you could certainly imagine that uh, cohabitation go, 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 go. Um, you, you, you could have nine years um, instead of five. I mean, there are all kinds of variations and games you can play with that, uh, with that, with that business of numbers. Um, I think the argument for having a longer time um, and for having some restriction on people uh, going into the House of Commons after a period in the House of Lords, if there should be some sort of gap, maybe, this is one of the things we'd be suggesting. To the gap, maybe 10, 15 years, um, between somebody uh, being elected to one house and being elected to another. There could be various different ways in which you could emphasize the difference between the two. You could have different election systems, for example, uh, for, for the different you know, kinds of election. There are different ways, all kinds of different ways in which you could differentiate the two. But at the end of the day, the big difference is whether you're elected. The legitimacy point is linked to that. If you had uh, a small number, 150, say, elected members of the House of Lords, there'd be huge constituencies that would embrace in the city, <coughs> in a suburb, or a small town, in a way that normally our zone constituencies don't. And they would almost certainly come in on proportional representation. And they could say, we're more legitimate than you are, we've got a bigger terrain, we've got PR, and who are you? Because the proposal will be that the powers of the Lords will remain the same, but they can't. The only good elected people would be a tussle. And it's, if you wanted to push it and say, well, we're more legitimate than you because of our 
electoral arrangements are much more robust, even if they've got AB, which I suspect they won't. You can see all sorts of changes in the emotional job. Yeah, right. but the moment it happens, straight away, I think. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, sorry, but can I just clarify what I was just thinking about? Is that you started to turn with a landslide, say, like uh, the, the, the initial moments of the last Labour government, and you haven't been inside at that point or at that period, and I think that the elections would probably need to be on the same day, my, my guess is right, then you might start with an overwhelming sense, even though the proportion is relatively small in the upper house, in going in one direction. Then after a period of years, and of course actually it's taken a decade to work its way through this one, so the nine year system might catch the change in times, but it, it might be much earlier. Yeah. You might then find you've got, on the one hand, going with you, and then suddenly it sort of slows up. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. As it backs up. And then, then of course, there's the class. You said the disaster. I mean, that's what President Obama is doing with now. Uh, you know, some of these things are not disaster, they're challenges. But their politics are meant to be for intelligent people. And, uh, <laughs> and, and these are exactly, exactly the sort of challenges uh, which you should be ready to think about and solve uh, if, you, if you're going to politics. And there'll be an unintended consequence of whatever if there is reform that not one of us has got a sense of. Because there always is. It solves a lot, doesn't it? This is an argument against constitutional change, far from it, but there's always some consequence that shuts on that you don't anticipate. Yeah, no, that's perfectly true. But it's a great scheme for avoiding boredom. That's <laughs> 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 It is, as we've seen, it's a subject of infinite variety and probably infinite opinions, you know, which is why I've stated it so long ago. Yes, sir. Um, yeah, we've talked about the possibility of is very interesting. I mean, which is the more legitimate? Uh, a member of parliament who's got a, quite a good majority in his constituency, <coughs> like a fiddle of expenses, or um, the vice chancellor of an open university who's um, renowned everywhere for his wisdom and good sense. You know, these are, these are balances between two different, different kinds of human beings. And you just have to make up your mind which you prefer. Tom May just said that not the answer is not more politicians. Yes. Well, it's cool. well that's why we're reducing the Reducing the size of the House of Commons under this, um, the second part of this bill, yeah. 65 to 60. We've got to reduce the size of the House of Commons, that's because it, it's, it's 750. It's right. going to rise to 800, isn't it, before we um, the next one? And, 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 and there's no room for us to sit. The seat, seating problems become acute. That we, you know, some of us are quite large in the meeting, but we have to shuffle, shuffle um, in, a, in a delicate way in order to have a seat. Yes, yes sir, indeed. Uh, the assumption seems to be that the current crisis is going to end up in the entailment of the Lord's power. But isn't the answer actually giving you a bit more power so you can do away with the mischief of putting two bills together and calling them one? Mm. Well, I mean, that's a... That's a um, the, the, the party argument of that accusation is they're both concerned with fairness, the fairness of having uh, elections. Uh, in, a, in, a, in, a decent, in a decent way, and, and in, a, in a way that the public wants. That's the link between the two parts of the, of the, of the, of the bill. Given the House of Lords' new power, I, I, I don't think it's not really a runner. It, it's not really something that people are arguing about. Um, um, the, the present powers, which are a, a delaying power, um, and uh, a power to insist on answers. Um, that, that, that's not to be neglected, that insisting on answers. Um, you can, you, 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 if you've got a minister in a tight spot, um, tw tw twisting his 
difficulties, making them more intense um, in, in, in the laws. It's, it's, a, it's another way of doing it. You, you can you, you, you give it a second go at it, uh, and, and this can sometimes be quite important. So all these, the, all these things, so many of these things are a, 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 a matter of balance. Uh, I don't think we've got the balance exactly right, but I think that um, as we proceed and try and improve the balance, uh, we, we should be careful not to throw, not to throw the baby away. Well, Douglas, I've got some mutterings that uh, the ongoing deadlock could lead to the government imposing some sort of rule change, as for the question asked earlier, maybe a uh, guillotine system, some of that actually exists in the Commons. Um, do you think this would be feasible without primary legislation? And uh, if it would be, what and procedurally, how would this rule change come out? So I think really can, can we could we get to a guillotine system in laws without primary legislation? I think no. I, mean, I think the lawyers are probably busy themselves at this moment about that. What, what do you think? I well, think the Commons didn't do it through legislation. They just read, did a yes. resolution, yes. and it would all be portrayed as well. This is a one-off. We'll never do it again. But once the precedent is broken, yes, it will be there forever. We have gone through a valve through which we cannot return. That's all part of it. And getting ready for a tent, etc. That will be a speech you've made on that. I know, but that is a serious part of it. Now, I think, I think you could have guillotines just by the House voting for a, a closure of the time zone. But if the House refused to do that, because, as Lord Heard said, there's a lot of people who are concerned about it who are not willing to do Crossbenchers are almost wholly not, yeah. not uh, willing to introduce guillotines. Probably quite a lot of Labour members are. You wouldn't be able to get guillotines in that work. No. That then might, if the government was determined to have timetables, it could only do it by introducing a bill that empowered them to uh, have timetables. And then have a And then we all pass. No, I mean, it's, uh, these arguments are, are reflected in the in the, in the, in the discussions I'm going on, which are. Well, Douglas, thank you. Um, you said something which I always think I thought caught you for me very well. Politics is for intelligent people. You've always acted in behaviour as if that was true, <laughs> <laughs> which is thoroughly admirable. Um, it's an aspiration. It's an aspiration. <laughs> I, I, I always admired it. Um, it's terrific. Thank you so much for the wide ranging and thinking it with what we're all facing now. And you're quite right, it hasn't been reported in that front in that one, but it's a... It's a Perhaps doesn't understand the House of Lords. No, no, no. Well, I don't, I don't. I mean, I, I, no, no, it's no, going to no. take me another four years, so I'm just sympathise with the press. Five years, probably, but even so, there is this drama. And unless you get pictures in the paper of people falling asleep... Yes. And, uh, in their own ...and reliving prep schools in dormitories and all that, and they uh, love all that. It, it's, it's the eating comedy side. Well, thank you very much, Douglas. Thank you too for the speakers on this for this evening. Uh, our, and uh, Queen Mary, Miley Group, and the Politics and International Relations School. Uh, our sponsor, Hewlett Packard, our new friends at Babcock. Most of all, thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.